I would first of all like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and especially Caroline Gifra, whom I had the pleasure of welcoming to our lab a few years ago, and uh, whose research on wheel-made ceramic productions has directly contributed to the extension of this field of research in the Mediterranean. I would also like to say to all the participants how impressed I was by their contribution. It is a great satisfaction to see how ceramic technology has progressively invested archaeological studies, whatever the chronological area, from prehistory to medieval times, uh, from the old world to the new world. I propose to discuss the contributions of this session by elaborating on the two following themes, conducting technological analysis and adopting the potter's wheel. Conducting technological analysis. All the articles of this session present technological analysis whose common goal is first to characterize wheel potting traditions, and second, to discuss them in terms of social groups and evolution. The way the technological analysis is carried out is therefore a crucial step. The more detailed it is, the best we can characterize the potting traditions and then approach the social groups behind. Hence, this reflection on technological analysis, which, from my point of view, still falls short of what it should be, given the interpretative ambitions behind each of them. Technological analysis implies a combined analysis of surface features and microfabrics, examining in particular fresh radial sections, sampled at around mid-height of the vessels, not in the bees or rim areas, with the stereo microscope at 1030 magnification. This practice is apparently not yet common, either because archaeologists have a negative view of breaking shirts, or I presume because it's considered difficult to examine the sections and more precisely to detect the attributes, significance of coil fissures, coil size, coil placement, as well as to analyze the orientation of voids and inclusions to evaluate how rotary kinetic energy was used. This examination of radial sections is absolutely necessarily necessary to accurately describe forming techniques. Of course, it doesn't exclude other analytical techniques, such as tomography, which permits a good illustration of what we see while examining fresh section. The advantage of this mesoscale of analysis is that it is a low-cost technique that can be applied on a large number of shirts while examining ceramic assemblages, allowing the researcher to understand his her material on the spot in connection with the analysis of surface features, which is a major point. Thus, when Alice Gunnarsson and collaborators discuss the coexistence of different potting practices, it would have been really helpful to have an analysis of the radial sections of the vessels for assessing the wheel coiling method. The principle is that the pearl pattern will differ accordingly. The more pressures with rotary kinetic energy, the more elongated and subparalleled voids. According to the pictures and the very good photographs of the surface features visualized with the assistance of reflectance transformation imaging, it seems that in the two cases under study, rotary kinetic energy was used only at the finishing stage. I suppose so because neither the internal or outer topography presents significant deformation with rotary kinetic energy. 
the weak compression of the clay walls with rotary kinetic energy is expected to be visible in radial section. The coil mesostructure will be kept with very few subparallel voids. Examination of fresh radial sections will also make possible to identify the coiling procedure, that is, the way the coils were laid and their size. Only then will one be able to distinguish between the two potting, potting traditions beyond the quality of the end products. The way bases are made would be another major observation because this trait, invisible on the pot, tends to resist to change and therefore indicates well the community where pottery has been learned. A similar comment goes for Sarah Doherty. It would be helpful to have close-up views of the radial sections of the Egyptian and Nubian wheel-made ceramics in order to assess whether they were wheel thrown or wheel coiled, and for the wheel coiled vessels, how the coils were placed. I want, I want to recall here that 25 years ago, Marie-Agnès Corti and I have characterized the clay microstructural pattern of wheel coiled and wheel thrown clay paste thanks to the understanding of the mechanism that explained the deformation by reference to the empirical and theoretical knowledge of soil mechanics. In the case of wheel thrown pots, this is the sliding of the clay domains which shear on the whole clay mass during roughing out, which explains the random microstructural arrangement. In radial section, at a mesoscale, this arrangement is characterized by a dense homogeneous mesostructure a random orientation and distribution of the quartz fraction, as well as a random distribution of the porosity. In contrast, the wheel coil paste in radial section show elongated vertically oriented voids parallel to the extension of the walls, as well as a mesostructure with clearly alternating zones oriented parallel to the walls and less oriented zones. It also shows fissures indicating joint of coils. I insist on the fact that these differences in orientation of the voids and inclusions depending on these techniques visible at the mesoscale can be explained in terms of clay behavior and are therefore well-founded attributes to identify the different wheel fashioning techniques. In the case of the Egyptian material found in Nubia, I question whether it is wheel thrown or wheel coiled because I had the opportunity to examine Egyptian style pottery dated from the 12th century BC and found that the site of Betchian in the Jordan Valley were Egyptian garnisons settled during the Late Bronze Age. One of the main goals was to test the proposition that the locally made Egyptian style pottery at Betchian and at various southern Levantine sites in general, also made of the same clays as the standard Canaanite shapes, was made by Egyptian potters using different techniques. In other words, we wanted to test the hypothesis that we had two distinct social communities of potters with roots in two different backgrounds, Egyptian and Canaanite. Standard Egyptian and Canaanite forms were chosen, which are representative of the respective assemblages. Egyptian types included mainly simple bowls, beer jars, and handleless red slip jars. Canaanite types included mainly bowls and craters. Surface features of the various vessels were observed, and fresh bricks were examined under a stereo microscope. All the examined Egyptian style vessels were wheel coiled. That is, the rough out was made out of coils and then thin and shaped on a wheel with rotary kinetic energy was probably up to about 100 rotation per minute by reference to Catherine Powell's experiment with Egyptian basalt wheels. The wheel coiling technique is at this indicated by coil fissures visible on the vessel surface, irregular concentric of a thickness, preferential horizontal fracture, 
and by a network of subparallel fissures visible in the section of fresh breaks. In the fresh radial section, joints between two coils are marked by aligned polyconcave voids. In a number of samples clipped from Egyptian-style vessel, simple bowls and beer jars, these voids were consistently horizontally aligned, indicating that the laying of the coils was horizontal. The coils were around 100 cm high. They were also clearly visible at the junction of the wall and the base of the beer jars. As for the Canaanite balls and craters, like the Egyptian forms, all the ones examined were wheel coiled. The main difference is in the placing of the coils. They are laid bevelled rather than horizontal, as shown by the diagonal alignment of the small voids in the vessel sections. Their size are also smaller than the Egyptian ones. Thus, while similar chain opératoires were reconstructed for Egyptian and Canaanite forms, Several manufacturing traits enabled us to distinguish the two traditions and to confirm the existence of two potter communities at Betshian. The most distinctive features included the size of coils and the way they were placed. Further support for the clear divide between the two production scheme is the fact that after the departure of the Egyptians at the end of the 20th dynasty, all Egyptian-style pottery ceased. Needless to say that a detailed comparison with the Egyptian vessels in Nubia would be highly interesting, in particular to compare the Egyptian involvement in this region. Lastly, as suggested by Sarah Doherty for the original Egyptian material, there remains the question of a possible difference in forming technique depending on the size of the containers. The wheel throwing technique would be dedicated to the manufacture of small balls and the wheel coiling technique to the manufacture of bigger vessels. This issue of forming technique depending on functional and size category is also raised by Xenia Charalambidou who questions the introduction of the rotary movement in the making of local courseware in the Cyclades, including amphora and cooking jacks. In order to discuss the introduction of the wheel coiling technique or the wheel throwing technique wherever the way rotary kinetic energy was used and how it evolved needs to be detailed. This is all the more important that the conditions favorable for the adoptions of a cultural trait depends on the nature of this trait. In the case of the quartz ware and the Cyclades, uh, it is not really clear whether the vessels were only finished with the rotary movement or if they were wheel coiled or even wheel thrown. The way the turntable uh, is used in Cyprus is said to be comparable to the way it was used for the course warrior in the Cyclades. The point is that in Cyprus, the use of the rotary movement doesn't entail the use of rotary kinetic energy in the shaping of the vessels. The turntable is used only to help the pot to rotate, and such a rotation can be achieved without even a turntable, as shown by ethnographic examples. Applying continuous pressures when smoothing walls or shaping the rim doesn't imply necessarily that they are combined with rotary kinetic energy. In this regard, concentric parallel striations on walls or well-shaped rims are not sufficient indicators to infer the use of rotary kinetic energy at the shaping stage. Again, an examination of the radial sections would be necessary. Let us here specify that using turntable as only to rotate the part continuously doesn't entail to develop the same skills than the ones involved in the wheel fashioning techniques. These are skills developed within the framework of forming technique without rotary kinetic energy. 
On the contrary, skills involved in the wheel coiling technique are comparable to the ones involved in the wheel throwing technique and contrary to what has been in fact supposed in two papers. Indeed, I recall that the differences in skills between wheel throwing and wheel coiling have been studied by Agnès Gelbert in an article dated from uh, 1998 on the basis of field experiment conducted in Spain with potters practicing wheel throwing and wheel coiling. Her results indicate motor skills shared by all potters. These are related to controlling, thinning and shaping with with rotary kinetic energy, that is to master the abilities whose learning duration differs between forming with and without rotary kinetic energy. This issue of skills, of course, has considerable implications for understanding the dissemination of wheel fashioning techniques. As for the relationship between the wheel fashioning technique and the type of rotary instrument, it has been evoked in several papers. I want to recall that we can identify how rotary kinetic energy was used on the basis of ceramic surface features and microfabrics. However, identifying the type of wheel from the way rotary kinetic energy was used is far from obvious. When small pots are wheel thrown, it can be said that the wheel was revolving at a minimum of 100, 120 rounds per minute because this is the minimum speed required to throw small pots on the wheel, as shown by Catherine Polwer's experiments and ours. These experiments have shown also that the speed of 100, 120 rounds per minute is not enough to throw pots weighing more than 1, 2 kilo because of the friction of the pressures exerted on the clay mass at the centering stage and which slow down the rotation of the wheel. Hence, big wheel thrown pots are usually supposed to have been thrown on wheels rotating at 200 round per minute and beyond. But even such a deduction is not straightforward. Indeed, it depends on the kneading and centering procedures. If one doesn't knead and center clay with rotary kinetic energy before the thinning and shaping operations, then big pots can be thrown on wheels rotating at 100, 120 round per minute only. This is the case in Myanmar where potters pile up masses of clay, then exert successively discontinuous vertical pressures and continuous horizontal pressures to form a semi-rounded clay mass. During this operation, the wheel is activated in a slow way just to allow the potter to work on the different sides of the clay mass. Then this clay mass is opened and the walls thinned and shaped with rotary kinetic energy. When the potter exerts a bimanual activity of the two hands to thin the wall with the wheel rotating by itself, the speed of the wheel reaches around 100, 120 round per minute, as we, you will see now in a short film.
The clay paste thrown on these slow wheels presents a dense homogeneous mesostructure combined with big polyconcave voids and elongated vertically oriented voids parallel to the extension of the walls. These voids are the results of the way the clay was kneaded without rotary kinetic energy, contrarily to wheel thrown pots. The elongation of the voids is the consequence of interdigital pressures during the final shaping operation. However, there is no ambiguity between this pattern and the one characterizing the wheel coiling technique because there is no fissures indicating joint of coil, which remains the best indicator for identifying the wheel coiling technique. As for the wheel coiling technique, it can be carried out on slow wheels rotating at a speed of 30 to 100 rounds per minute. The differences in the orientation of the voids and the inclusion do not reflect differences in the speed of the wheel, but differences in compression. Strong compression producing elongated, vertically oriented voids parallel to the walls. Weak compression conserving the coil mesostructure. Johnny Baldi proposes to deduce the speed of the wheel from the location of the void in the core of the radial section. This hypothesis is based on a series of experiments which highlight a correlation between the speed of the wheel and the parole pattern. Now, and this is a general statement about experimentation, correlations need to be explained before a feature, like for example a specific parole pattern, can be considered as a diagnostic attribute. In the case of the location of voids, it may be multifactorial. This implies that to make it a diagnostic attribute requires to understand the mechanism generating it. For this purpose, there is a need to call upon clay scientists' knowledge and theory so that we archaeologists can propose explanations in relationship with the researchers specialized in this domain. Along the same lines, the highly interesting experiment designed to understand how local low-quality clay material in the medieval Bohemian Moravian Highlands needed to be mature for wheel-throwing vessels would deserve an explanation in terms of clay behavior. Clay scientists have indeed shown that long maturing periods result in the development of organic clay gels. They act as lubricating substances during wedging, favoring the cohesion and movement by shearing of the clay domains, optimizing thus the plasticity of the clay. I will now turn to the second theme addressed by several papers, namely the adoption or non-adoption of the wheel technology. First of all, with regard to the non-adoption of the wheel technology, the example of the Grebonish ware in Greece shows that the same types of vessels were made by different communities of potters, some using the wheel, others not using it. These communities lived close or at a distance from each other. Hence, the question of the adoption of the wheel technology, given on the one hand a phenomenon of homogenization of the type of vessels consumed on a macro-regional scale that argues in favor of a common cultural framework, and on the other hand, despite this common cultural framework, a phenomenon of persistent differentiation of technical systems among potters. This is not an isolated case because it responds above all to anthropological invariance. First, same types of vessel can be adopted over large areas without any interaction between producers. I will give the example of the widespread adoption of the granite tempered water jar in northwest India by two social communities of potters, Hindu and Muslim, who used to produce distinct ranges of morphofunctional vessels and who differ by their potting tools. 
The diffusion of this type of vessel occurred mainly through indirect transmission. Indirect transmission occurred on the one hand through brokers and shopkeepers who asked explicitly to the porters to make this type of vessel. And on the other hand, through the exposure of this type of jar in public places. Indirect transmission was tri triggered by the intention of the artisans to produce a model valued by the consumers and which sells well. So it explains how a same type of ware can be both distributed over a large area and made by communities of potters having different ways of doing things. Secondly, interactions between communities with different ways of doing things do not necessarily imply a transfer of technical traits with technical advantages. As stated by an invariant based on ethnoarchological field studies and experiments, technological boundaries persist in contexts where the different groups interact on a regular basis, no matter the nature of the interactions, distant or close, or the nature of the ties within each group. In other words, the absence of transfer of technical traits between communities in close geographical proximity and using different technological standards doesn't mean lack of interactions. On the contrary, interactions are of a major importance in the polarization process because interactions are required for actors to correlate techniques and social groups. As shown by the studies on communities of practice, the correlation between technological standards and social identity gets built in the process of the practice of the technique. This correlation then plays in favor of a differentiation between the social groups that are in contact. The consequence is the non-borrowing of technical traits over the long term, as seen in numerous examples in the Mediterranean from the early Bronze Age to the present day. One of the consequences of the non-diffusion of the wheel technology in regions where handmade potting traditions exist is its disappearance when the demand for wheel-made vessels disappears. This is the case in Italy during the final Bronze Age, as shown by Porta. The disappearance of the wheel technology for fine words attesting de facto to the disappearance of the potters whose production was conditioned by the demand for these wares. In this case study, the wheel technology remains, but only to make pitoy, showing well again the association between type of container and technology and the maintenance of potting tradition as long as the demand for the related type of vessels continues. In brief, as long as the wheel technology is dedicated to the manufacture of a limited number of types of containers and is therefore in the hands of a limited number of craftsmen, it is likely to disappear as soon as demand collapses. This is how the potter's wheel disappeared twice in a row in the southern Levant, once in the 5th millennium BC and the second time in the 3rd millennium BC, In both cases, wheel-made vessels were produced by a limited number of craftsmen responding to the needs of local elites. These mechanisms of differentiation between social group and the consequent non-transfer of techniques could explain why the Minoan wheel didn't spread to the northeast Peloponnese. The argument would be all the more solid as it could be shown that in Crete and the Peloponnese, the way of wheel fashioning the vessels was different. The variation in the ways of making would testify to two distinct communities of potters and the non-transfer of the wheel could be explained in terms of polarization between these communities. Another explanation could be that neither potter's wheel had a technical advantage over the others.
The cost of adaptation to new wheels is less convincing to understand the non-adoption of a new type of wheel. We conducted an experiment asking potters using food-driven low-inertia kick wheel to throw pots on a hand-driven high-inertia stick wheel and vice versa. Results showed that throwing with an unfamiliar wheel didn't give rise to significant difficulties for the participants. This was predictable because both the stick wheel and the kick wheel allow potters to use their hands freely. Hence, even though the required postures and the mode of activation of the two wheels were different, once the wheel was revolving, potters were able to transfer their hand position to the new situation. This can be explained by the way the coordinative structures of the potters reorganize to maintain a fine control of the hand positions. In short, adoption of a new wheel doesn't involve significant changes in fashioning skills, even though change in posture was definitely considered a strong constraint. With regard to the adoption of the wheel forming technique in Mesopotamia, Johnny Baldi questions the co-occurrence of the synchronous emergence of the wheel in North and South Mesopotamia. Is it a convergence? or borrowing between the two regions. He shows that each region has its own way of using the wheel. The emergence of the wheel in the two regions of Mesopotamia would therefore not be the result of borrowing, but rather of convergence. But does the borrowing of a technical trait necessarily imply a faithful copy of that trait? Ethnographic examples show that this is not always the case. For example, in northern India, the burrowing of the Muslim kiln by Hindu potters who used to fire their pots in the open air shows that they did not faithfully reproduce the kiln even though they were able to draw the Muslim kiln. The burrowing was accompanied by transformations that leave no trace of the origin of the burrowing. This leads me to the following suggestion. As long as elements of material culture indicate contacts between two regions, then borrowings are possible. And in this context, an adaptation of the borrowing to the local tradition is a plausible interpretation. This question of adapting a foreign technique to local traditions is well illustrated by the case of the Caribbean. In this case study, there is no doubt about the introduction of the port's will by the Spanish. But the way it is used raises questions about the identity of the potters. Indeed, these potters make Iberian forms, decorations of African origin, and use a shaping technique that combines a local technique, the coiling technique, with an exogenous shaping technique, the wheel shaping technique. The wheel coiling technique would indicate the appropriation of the wheel by the local potters, and therefore potters composed of local workers working under the colonial system. While this interpretation is well supported by the stylistic origin of the decoration, there remains an open question. Indeed, it can be assumed that it was a Spanish potter who taught the potter's wheel technique to the local workers. To what extent, then, was this Spanish potter going to teach a different technique than the one he was practicing? To what extent was this technique not also practiced by Spanish potters? One can suppose, indeed, that the wheel coiling technique could be practiced in Spain at that time, in particular for the manufacture of jars, an important category of vessels for settlers. Could the potter sent to the Caribbean have been specialized in the manufacture of jars and thus also practicing the wheel coiling technique? To sum up, it is clear that the context in which the wheel is used is a determining factor in its evolution. 
when its use is restricted to the manufacture of vessels intended for elites, the will is not in condition to resist historical events such as the disappearance of these elites. When the will coexists with other pottery traditions, the mechanism of differentiation between communities leads to its refusal to be adopted. On the other hand, when the will is used by remote communities, then it can be borrowed, but only by specialized craftsmen, given the skills involved. It is also in a context of specialized artisans that the will is gradually being adopted. These general rules of evolution, which can be explained in terms of the context in which the transmission mechanisms are actualized, explain the different trajectory described in the various contributions. I would like to conclude on this issue by once again warmly thanking all the participants in this session for all the questions raised, which I found particularly stimulating. Thank you.